Leadership is not a rank. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is a decision. Leadership is a choice. You know, life is hard. Leadership is hard. Being part of great companies and teams like PayPal and, and, and Nike are hard, but opening our hearts to the adversity and opening our hearts to the challenges and acknowledging that's part of the process is just one of the learnings, you know, along the way. I, I hate adversity. I want everything to go well. I like, go, you know, <laughs> but it's so funny because when I look back in my life, the, the moments that have had the most purpose and meaning for me, I'm most proud of in hindsight, professionally and personally, were almost always periods of adversity. Dr. Mahdi had never expected to become the second in command so soon. He said, By becoming Deputy Prime Minister, I had already gone further than I had ever expected when I first became a politician. He had also never imagined becoming the Deputy Prime Minister less than 10 years of his readmission into AMNO. He said, Almost nine years had passed since I had been expelled from the party. While I had uh, harbored hopes of returning to Amno during my years of political exile, I had never imagined that I would rise to the second highest position within the party less than a decade after my expulsion. When I stepped back to look at myself then, I was amazed at how quickly, uh, how quickly I was moving up, overtaking several senior politicians along the way. I put it down to hard work and good luck. I did not know then that more changes were in store for me and that they uh, would take place just a few short years later. Hard work and good luck. The story of Dr. Mahathir's uh, hard work and good luck was also the story of a Muslim leader who conquered Egypt about 800 years ago. He was uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, or well known in the West as Saladin. Egypt in the late 12th century was in a political turmoil. The Fatimid Caliphate of Ismaili uh, Shia Muslim was in the brink of collapse. The Caliph uh, of Al Adid was a minor. The ruling was taken over by his uh, vizier or the Prime Minister, Shawar ibn Mujir al Sa'adi, uh, who served uh, Egypt as a vizier between uh, 1162 to 1169. Uh, he was the de facto, uh, de facto leader who, uh, whose uh, betrayal changed the course of Egypt's history. In December 1168, uh, uh, Salahuddin's uncle uh, Shirkuh and his army were ordered by uh, Seljuk Sultan uh, Nuruddin to march to Cairo and uh, free the city from Shawar. Salahuddin, who was uh, reluctant to join the expedition, uh, however, was forced by his master Nuruddin. Salahuddin and uh, Shirkuh's army arrived in Cairo in early January uh, 1169 and was uh, celebrated as the saviour of the Kyrenees and Egypt. Shawar's uh, treasury was penalised. Shirkuh was then uh, made a new vizier of uh, Egypt. Unfortunately, his, day, uh, his days in office were cut short by his death uh, on uh, March 22nd in 1169. After the passing of uh, Shirkuh, Five candidates were shortlisted for Egypt's new visa. Salahuddin is one of them. At the age of over 32, he is the youngest novice and the most inexperienced in politics as well as administration. Others are all the seniors and well-to-do figures of the Nuruddin court. Some had also highly experienced in politics and a Seljuk administrative office. But luck was at Salahuddin's disposal. He was uh, made the vizier of uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt in 1169. A, st a stroke of good luck that uh, Salahuddin uh, called a gift from God. 
In 1976, Dr. Mahade is still considered a lack of experience as compared to two other AMNO vice president, Gafar Baba and Tengku Razali. Tun Gafar was a highly experienced politician. Uh, while Dr. Mahade is still a student at medical college, uh, Gafar was already a Malaika AMNO state secretary in 1951. From 1955 to 1963, he was the Chief Minister of Malacca. In 1972, when Mahadi uh, had made his first attempt to contest the Vice Presidency and lost, uh, Gafar Baba was among uh, the three winning candidates. Later in 1974, Dr. Mahadi and uh, Gafar Baba returned to contest the post and uh, both had won, but Gafar Baba was the top with the highest votes. If uh, seniority and uh, popularity were the basis for Tun Hussein to select his deputy, then uh, Gafar Baba was ultimately the first choice. Another contender, uh, Tengku Razali, was a well-to-do AMNO leader and uh, respected not only for his uh, leadership but also for his uh, royalty background. As an AMNO vice president, uh, he was considered the second in uh, seniority and Mahade was the most junior. If the status, uh, seniority and uh, popularity were the basis and uh, if Tun Gafar uh, Baba was not in the list, then uh, Tun Hussein must have uh, selected Tunku Razali uh, instead of uh, Dr. Mahadi. A stroke of uh, good luck, however, was with Dr. Mahadi. Tun Hussein on uh, did consider to follow the tradition to appoint Gafar Baba the most senior vice president. Unfortunately, Gafar, according to uh, Milner and Mauzi, uh, 2002 and Wayne, 2009, did not project an uh, image of modernity, lack of higher education and uh, social graces and was not comfortable speaking English. Tun Hussein could appoint the second choice, Tengku Razali, a royal, sophisticated and dependable. But Tengku Razali was too young, still under 40, unmarried and lacked a cabinet experience. Tun Hussein could also go beyond the party vice presidential uh, lineup to appoint uh, Ghazali Shafi'i, a home minister and uh, his strong supporter. Ghazali was uh, familiar with international relations and had uh, the most uh, recognized name in the region and was uh, popular with neighbors such as Indonesia and Singapore. The Indonesian government had also shown their great interest to propose Ghazali to be the Tunusian's deputy. But this triggered an unwelcome uh, foreign interference uh, to the country's internal affairs. For over six weeks, uh, Tunusian had been facing with the dilemma to find the best among the best. And uh, Dr. Mahade was uh, finally the one. Dr. Mahade did not purely believe in good luck. He said, I was amazed at uh, how quickly I was moving up, overtaking uh, several senior politicians along the way. I put it down to hard work and good luck. From his perspective, uh, hard work, wisdom and persistence had played a, a more important role. Since uh, his readmission uh, to AMNO in 1972, he has put great efforts and hard work for the party, the country and the Malays a great cause that he uh, ceaselessly uh, fought for. Tun Hussein On must have realised his dedication towards the party, the country and the Malays. Developing successful habits of leadership is the process of improving knowledge, skill and uh, desire from the level of dependence to independence uh, and to interdependence. Uh, Stephen Covey in 1989 explained, On the maturity continuum, dependence is the paradigm of you. You take care of me, you came through me, you didn't come through, I blame you for the result. Independence is the paradigm of I, I can do it, I am responsible, I am self-reliant, I can choose. Interdependence is the paradigm of we, We can do it, we can cooperate, we can combine our talents and abilities and create something greater together. Dependent people need others to get what they want. Independent people can get what they want through their own effort. Interdependent people combine their efforts uh, with the efforts of others to achieve their greatest uh, success. These three levels of natural laws of growth exist within the maturity uh, continuum. Uh, develop Uh, through effective habits. Interestingly, if we examine Dr. Mahathir's leadership development, we could find that he had grown through all these three levels of maturity continuum. 
in the first place uh, he thought that he was a leader who could get into the position through his total dependence on others he took for granted the position he secured in the party during his early years of a political career for example he enjoyed the support and won the 1964 general election without knowing that the support he gained was dependent upon the party the majority of the people had given support to the party uh, he was representing they gave support whenever they like and they will also take it back whenever they like at this point most of them who voted for dr made not because who he is but what he is uh, what he is representing after losing the 1969 general election uh, he sensed his failure to control the events through the total dependence on the party there are a lot more events that he could not control he took the courage to challenge the tunku's leadership and uh, ended up being in political exile for more than 2 years he was he was living in the political wilderness and the maturity continuum uh, process evolved to independence level he felt free yet the feeling of a freedom from depending on others demanded more independent works he struggled to develop his leadership reputation through knowledge skills and desire at this moment his paradigm had shifted from a dependent paradigm which strongly believed that the party is taking care of him to an independent paradigm which strongly believed that he can do it by himself he is uh, responsible so he has to take charge of his independent self directed learning he is uh, self reliant so he will not expect others to back him and he can choose whatever things he wanted to do to achieve his leadership dream independent leaders believe that they could get what they wanted through their own efforts as we have discussed in the previous uh, chapters on uh, his struggle during the, the expulsion from amno between the end of 1969 to early 1972 he had developed the reputation through independent self directed learning skills enhancements and the highest purpose to fight for the betterment of the malays and the country the world is too dangerous and the world is too difficult for you to think that you can do these things alone if you find your spark i commend you now who are you going to ask for help and when are you going to accept help when it's offered learn that skill learn by practicing helping each other It'll be the single most valuable thing you ever learn in your entire life to accept help when it's offered and to ask for it when you know that you can't do it. The amazing thing is when you learn to ask for help, you'll discover that there are people all around you who've always wanted to help you, they just didn't think you needed it because you kept pretending that you had everything under control. And the minute you say, "I don't know what I'm doing. I'm stuck. I'm scared. I don't think I can do this." You will find that lots of people who love you will rush in and take care of you. But that will only happen if you learn to take care of them first. At the end of, of uh, his struggle within the boundary of independence, he realized that to get things done to achieve the highest purpose that he strongly believed, he needed to work with others. That was uh, when his paradigm of independence uh, began to shift towards the paradigm of interdependence. Dr Mahadi realized that he had to return to Amno and regain the momentum to achieve his leadership dreams. He needed a platform, a stage to voice out his views and people to support and back him. When uh, he was readmitted in March 1972, he wasted no time to grow uh, his interdependent relation. He dared himself to contest the vice president post although the winning possibility was low. what he had achieved was the interpersonal experience the ability to send the message to the people that he is willing to work together and cooperate with them he would like the people to know his talents and abilities and combined with their support they could create something greater together interdependent leaders share their dreams with people and they have access to the vast resources and potential of the people that would make the dreams come true By 1974 general election Dr Mahade had already developed the sense of interdependence in his leadership tasks and responsibilities given by Tun Razak were used to develop uh, the sense of interdependence further his circle of influence uh, was getting bigger while reducing further the circle of concern as we go about our lives we operate in two circles the first is our circle of concern these are things that we care about or may even affect us 
but over which we have little or no control. The second is our circle of influence. These are things which we can control or influence. When people are reactive, they focus on the outer circle. They spend time and energy on things that they really can do nothing about. As a result, their circle of influence shrinks. When people are proactive, they focus on their inner circle of influence where their efforts will make a positive difference in relationships and results. As a result, their circle of influence grows. In leadership, we could find at least uh, four groups of people. The followers, the reactive leaders, the proactive leaders, and the reactive selfish leaders. Followers are the people who make leadership possible, but they do not have any control over how the leaders should act or react or where to focus time and energy. The best they can do is to ask. As far as leadership is concerned, they are passive doers. Reactive leaders focus their effort uh, in the circle of concern uh, B, outside of the circle of influence A, such as the weaknesses of other leaders or, or their opponents. They will, uh, they will blame situation or other people when they could not deal with the problems. Often, they will use the language such as, I could not do anything about it because that was fell under someone else's jurisdiction. Sometimes when they could not meet the demand from their followers, they would blame their followers as greedy, ungrateful, impatient, and etc. When judging others, they will use complex problems as the justice. The failures of uh, their opponents to deal with complex and wicked problems, for instance, will be used to show the people that their opponents are weak and untrustworthy. This often happen among politicians. Their negative energy generated through an ongoing focus on the circle of concern uh, B and causes their circle of influence A to shrink. Proactive leaders, on the other hand, uh, focus their efforts on the circle of influence. They know themselves well and keep improving the interdependence paradigm. They use language uh, such as, let's look at our alternatives. I can choose a different approach. I control my own feelings. I can create an effective presentation. I will choose an appropriate response. This is contrary compared to the reactive leaders who say, I can't, I must, and if only. Proactive leaders say, I choose, I prefer, and I will. When bad things happen uh, or problems intensify, proactive leaders will not promptly jump uh, to a conclusion without knowing their ability to change or influence the course of action. If the problems fall in their circle of influence, A, they will focus uh, on this circle and work uh, on their strengths to solve them. If the problem fall in uh, their circle of concern B, they will also focus on the circle of influence A by enlarging and magnifying it instantaneously uh, reducing the size of the circle of concern B. Leaders are human. Some of them uh, grew uh, from better to good and great and died as a hero. Unfortunately, some grew from uh, better to good and that, uh, ended up to be a bad leader and died like a tyrant. This second group, uh, this group of uh, leaders are reactive, uh, selfish leaders uh, who uh, over-manage their circle of influence A expanding further out from the circle uh, uh, of concern B. These leaders uh, fall into the trap of undisciplined pursuit of more. They focus on pursuing the most uh, destructive ingredients for leaders, power, wealth and glory. As uh, Collins in 2009 explained, they will allocate more for themselves or their constituents. More money, more privileges, more fame, more of the spoils of success seeking to capitalize as much as possible in the short term rather than investing primarily in building for greatness and decades into the future. Recorded in a thousand years of human history are abundant examples of this kind of tyrant leaders. Many of them were considered as the chosen one and became a good leader then they ventured far out from the circle of concern until their power of influence uh, to power to influence and change the course of events became uh, absolute. At this point their leadership has changed from leading to bullying. They are no more a leader but a tyrant. Uh, they do not seek first to understand but expect to be understood. They blame first and are accountable second and they don't practice what they preach. Having understood the concept of uh, focus circles by Stephen Covey and its adaptation, uh, uh, its adaptation into the concept of leadership, we should by now be able to examine and describe uh, Dr. Mahathir's leadership focus circles. 
the figure below shows two figures uh, representing uh, Dr. Mahathir's uh, focus a circle since his first entry into a political career. Discussion in the previous uh, chapters indicated that between 1958 to uh, September 1969, Dr. Mahdi tend to be seen as a reactive leader. In the beginning, he seemed to be uh, so excited to uh, venture into a new career as a politician. In experience, uh, everything became a try and error ventures. His medical training uh, helped him to deal with problems and learn through stages, but early winning uh, succumbed him uh, to take everything for granted. He is heavily dependent upon the party's past glory. No many significant uh, uh, efforts he had done to reflect upon his leadership skills and reputation. Losing the 1969 uh, general election was uh, surely a loud and clear wake-up call for him. For uh, his focus at that moment was uh, purely on the circle of concern. He responded aggressively by putting the challenge towards the Tunku, the Tunku of Rahman, the, the president of the party. Figure A represents his focus of leadership energy, which uh, is within the circle of concern B. Inside this circle are the things uh, he could not control, such as uh, the sentiments of Chinese voters, the alliance lack of support from MCA, and the denial attitude of the Tunku. This obsession generated negative energy, which continues to shrink his uh, circle of influence. Fortunately, uh, his expulsion in uh, September 1969 uh, was a blessing that transformed the negative leadership energy into positive. His maturity continuum uh, moved from independence to in independence. For more than two years in political exile, Dr. Mahathir had developed leadership consciousness through many significant contributions, including the publication of the Malay Dilemma and expanding his views uh, through talks and sharing sessions. Towards the end of political exile, his maturity continuum uh, had already moved uh, from independence to interdependence. Figure B uh, represents Dr. Mahathir's uh, leadership focus circles between the end of 1969 to early 1976. From his expulsion to his appointment as the fourth deputy prime minister, his readmission into Amno had opened up his opportunity to channel his positive uh, energy into the circle of influence. That was uh, what he did and uh, that was also what Tun Hussein On had seen on him. By the time Tun Hussein was about to decide on his deputy, uh, Dr. Mahathir's circle of influence was already expanded uh, bigger and sufficient for Tun Hussein to justify Dr. Mahathir as uh, his best choice and to deny uh, Kafa Baba and Tengku Razali as well as uh, Razali Shafi's uh, opportunity.